which is the last chapter, and verse number 59. Om Gyant Miranda Sya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Un Militam Yenatas My Shri Gurabeno Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shimak Divakti Varam To Swami Tina Menina Maste Saraswari Devi Gaudavani Pacharini Nivrasesa Sunyavari Pastyat Yare Sutarine Panchakalpa the Rubis Chakri was in Dupe, the Chapatitanam, Pavane, Bio, Vaishnave, Bio, Namahon Maha Jai Si Krishna, Joy Tonapun Talanda, Sir Dway the Gada Harsi Vasadi, Oda Vakta Rinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Sir Prabhupada Kijai. <coughs> 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 So Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Pravitranayam saranam venasanaya chaduskatam dharma samstar panartaya sambhavama yuge yuge. So Krishna, <clears throat> Krishna has two businesses when he comes to the material world. <clears throat> those businesses are to um, destroy oh. those living entities who are disturbing the uh, peaceful existence of the devotees known these persons are known as demons and uh, he also comes to uplift re-establish the dharma or the religious principle at the time and he comes specifically to give pleasure to his devotees uh maharaj uh sorry to interrupt maharaj can you please tell me the words again there was some problem with my laptop yeah um uh, verse Ninth canto, 24th chapter, which is the last chapter in the ninth canto, uh, verse number 59. Mm -hmm. So um, we see this verse and this particular chapter, which contains this verse, especially the last. 10 verses are very much heralding the announcing the appearance of Krishna. This chapter precedes the beginning of the 10th canto, which is all about the advent of Lord Krishna and his pastimes. This particular verse is interesting because it gives us a little insight of Krishna and how he works in a, in a less direct way to do the same thing he does when he comes to the material world in a direct way. And that is to rid the world of demoniac personalities. Mm -hmm. So we'll read the verse. Aksohini nam patir bir asura nirpala chanai bhava akramya manaya abharaya krito damaha. Although the demons who take possession of the government are dressed like men of government, they do not do, know the duty of the government. Consequently, the, by the arrangement of God, uh, repeat that, consequently by the arrangement of God, such demons who possess great military strength fight with one another and thus the great burden of demons on the surface of the earth is reduced. The demons increase their military power by the will of the Lord, by will of the Supreme, and so that their numbers will be diminished and the devotees will have a chance to advance in Krishna consciousness. Very interesting translation here because it says, you can see how Krishna is directly involved in killing demons in a less direct way, which he did when he personally came. Because Prabhupada goes on to explain that Krishna doesn't have to come personally to kill the demons. He can do that through the material energy. And here's one such example. And we'll go on. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, for a paritranayam sadhunam venaisanaya chaduskritam. The sadhus, the devotees of the Lord, are always eager to advance the cause of Krishna consciousness so that the conditioned souls may be released from the bondage of birth and death. Mm -hmm. So this is the compassionate nature of the devotees. They want to act on behalf of the Lord 
in order to implement the mission of the Lord, which is to give more and more living entities the chance to become Krishna conscious. That is their focus. Continue by the Asuras, but the Asuras and demons impede the advancement of the Krishna conscious movement. And therefore Krishna arranges occasional hmm, fights between different Asuras who are very much interested in increasing their military power. The duty of the government or king is not to increase military power unnecessarily. The real duty of the government is to see the people of the state advance in Krishna consciousness. So now we understand what is not the duty of the government to increase military power simply for conquest, exploitation, but to be very much aware how people are advancing in the goal of life which is Krishna consciousness. In one statement, Srila Prabhupada makes the, he says the duty of the government is to see that each and every person is following their prescribed religious path. And then he went on to explain that it doesn't matter what the religious path is, it must be a bona fide religious path. And as long as people are following, then the government is actually in the right position to increase the uh, amenities for the people of the state and the needs of the people of the state. But one of the duties is to make sure that the that people are practicing their prescribed religion. And here Krishna says, for this purpose, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Chaturvarnyam Maya Sristam, Unakarma Vibhaga Saha, according to the three modes of nature and the work ascribed to them, the four divisions of human society were created by me. So here we have the Van Ashram statement. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Van Ashram was created by me directly. There should be an ideal class of men who are bona fide Brahmins, and they should give be given all protection. Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmanya Hitaya Cha. Krishna is very fond of Brahmanas and cows. The Brahmanas promulgate the cause of advancement in Krishna consciousness, and the cows give enough milk to maintain the body of the mode of goodness. The Kshatriyas, that's the next one down on the scale, and the government should be advised by the Brahmanas. Next, the Vaishyas should produce enough foodstuffs. And the Shu Sutras, who can't do anything beneficial on their own, should serve the three higher classes, the Brahman, Kshatris, and Vaishnavas, you know, the supportive workers. This is the arrangement of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, so that the conditioned souls will be released from the material condition and return back home, back to Godhead. This is the purpose of Krishna's descent on the surface of the earth. Paritranayam sarunam vinasanaya chaduskritam. Everyone must understand Krishna's activities. Janma karma chime divyam. If one understands the purpose of Krishna coming to this earth and performing his activities, one is immediately liberated. This liberation is the purpose of the creation and Krishna's descent upon the surface of the earth. Interesting. The liberation of the living entity is the purpose of the creation and why Krishna appears on this earth. Now there's an impediment to that process and here it is. Demons are very much interested in advancing a plan by which people will label, labor hard like cats and dogs and hogs. But Krishna's devotees want to teach Krishna consciousness so that people will be satisfied with plain living and Krishna conscious advancement. Hmm. Living simply according to one's need, according to how Krishna directed the living entities to live naturally, accordingly, and to advance in the goal of life, which is to become Krishna conscious. Although demons have created many plans for industry and hard labor, so people will work day and night like animals, this is not the purpose of civilization. So we can see what goes on today is not civilization. 
That's why Prabhupada's statements are very direct and somewhat cutting in explaining that civilization means uh, cow protection, Brahminical culture, God consciousness. These are the three principles that make up a progressive human society. Such endeavors that by the demons are jagati, jagato hita, that is they are meant for the misfortune of people in general. Shayaya, such activities lead to annihilation. In other words, the demons simply cause trouble. One who understands the purpose of, the Krish, of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, should seriously understand the importance of the Krishna conscious movement and seriously take part in it. One should not endeavor for Uga Karma, which is unnecessary work for sense gratification. And then we were, we've been explaining that in our lectures for the last few months, unnecessary activities for sense gratification. Simply as Prabhupada work, so working like animals simply for the basic needs of life, to eat, to sleep, to have family, and to defend oneself. So the basic activities of all living entities, including the animals and those below the animals. So why is the human being being forced by some uh, economic interests to simply work hard for things that are naturally given when one performs austerities on behalf of the Lord. Nunam pramatta, pramatta means madness. Guru te vikarma yadindriya priteya apranoti. Simply for sense gratification, people make plans for material happiness. Maya sukaya baram uravato vimudham. They do this because they are all vimudhas, rascals. Rascals means one who has his own program to cause trouble to others. For flickering happiness, people waste their human energy, not understanding the importance of Krishna conscious movement, but instead accusing the simple devotees of brainwashings. Demons may falsely accuse the preachers of the Krishna conscious movement, but Krishna will arrange a fight between the demons in which all of their military power will be engaged and both parties of the demons will be annihilated. So here we see We see how Krishna arranges for the demons to be destroyed in an indirect way. When Krishna was personally present, there were so many demons coming, one after another. We hear from the Srimad Bhagavatam and from other Vedic literatures how Krishna was very active daily in killing demons. They were constantly coming to harass the devotees and to, to cause trouble to Krishna. And Krishna being the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he made it his duty to rid the world of these demons. He left Vrindavan when he was 10 and a half years old in order to go to Mathura to reestablish Ugrasena on the throne and to kill King Kamsa and to again bring the devotees back into the leading position within that area of the world. But then Krishna stayed away for so many, many, many years practically. Uh, he came back once or twice to Vrindavan, his devotees, the Brijabhasis, his parents, his mother Yasoda, Nanda Maharaj, the gopis, the cowherd boys were constantly praying and counting the moments when Krishna would return. And Krishna was sending messages through various uh, agencies to let them know, I'll be back, but I have to finish these demons. So he stayed. And then there were more. There were Shishupal, there was Jairasandra, there was Dantravarka, uh, there was Keshi, um, uh, what was his name? Kasiraj, so many, many, many demons were still there outside of Mathura. And Krishna made uh, his plan to dispatch them one after another to the abode of Yamaraj. So Krishna made that his mission along with uplifting his devotees. So we can see that this is a very big part 
of Krishna's business in the material world is to arrange for the demons to be destroyed. We have our present situation now, and Prabhupada said in 1972, when he was giving many classes on the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, especially in the first canto, he says the demons are only increasing. They will continue to increase. This is Kali Yuga, and they're, they're, they're becoming more and more influential and more and more numerous in the world today. But he warned, he said, the devotees do not worry. Krishna is there. Krishna has come. Kali Kale, Nama Rupa, Krishna Avatar, Nama Hoite Hayasarva Jagat Nistara. Krishna has appeared in this age personally as his holy name, which is meant to push back the influence of the demoniac plans for control and exploitation of the world, and at the same time, give complete and perfect protection to the devotees. The devotees cannot be harmed by the demons as long as they adhere to complete shelter of Krishna, particularly his holy name. So we hear from the Acharyas how this world is a stage where there's a constant struggle between us sura suras, um, between demons and those who are godly in order to establish their own individual programs. In other words, the devotees want to uh, the world to be devotees of Krishna and worship Krishna and offer everything to Krishna and achieve the goal of life, which is to go back home, back to Godhead. And the demons simply want to exploit the material resources more and more for their own sense gratification. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita in the 16th chapter, he, he mimics, not mimics, but also paraphrases the mindset of the demons. So much wealth I have today and so much more will be mine in the future. My enemy has been killed and my other enemy will also be killed. I am, I am I'm surrounded by aristocratic relatives. I am happy, perfect, and powerful, and I shall give in charity, I shall rejoice. The demons always have plans, and I use that word always, have plans to exploit the resources of the world more and more, and to cause more and more difficulties to the general population. That is an ongoing thing which is going on today. It doesn't stop. Even the Srimad Bhagavatam, Padma Purana, and other places explain that this principle of two elements, demons and devotees, are constantly at each other's, uh, uh, you might say, at each other's throat in order to, uh, to uh, uh, they battle over the resources of the material energy. Because the material energy, is rich. It has so much wealth. The earth is by nature the abode of Lakshmi. And there is so much wealth buried into the earth and the demons want to take it out in the form. We see when, when Haranyaksha, he wanted to exploit the earth for as much gold as possible. And he was very uh, expert. So much so that he took so much gold out of the earth that the earth lost its balance within the, uh, within the cosmic logical cycle and fell out of its orbit into the bottom of the Garbodak ocean. It wasn't until the Lord appeared as Varahadev who picked up the earth and killed the demon and reestablished religious principles. So um, the demons are, are like that. There is a class of people who fit into that category. The whole 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita explains that these persons exist and their plans are always going on to exploit the population of the world. There's no such thing time when these demons are not either planning or actively engaged in exploiting the earth. Just like now, if you want to buy gold, Good luck. You hardly can find gold anywhere available. The demons have 
amassed nine, much, much of the gold within the world. They've also closed down the silver market. You can't buy silver, you can't buy gold. Many of the demons have exploited the, the earth for diamonds, especially in Africa. Their exploitations in that area of the world have brought many, many diamond mines. And so they are very materially wealthy. But the thing is, they're never satisfied. You, sometimes you might think, well, if I had that much wealth, I would be happy and I would just go on with my life. No, the demons cannot do that. That is their nature. They want more and more and more. It's like a burning fire that is never satisfied. They keep pouring logs onto the fire, which blaze the fire even more. The demons have the, the they want to play the role of God by being the providers of everything, by controlling everything and controlling the population underneath. And when people don't follow what they want, and then they make plans to destroy the, the people. That is the nature of demons. So Prabhupada, this verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam is spoken many thousands and thousands of years ago, but it's still very much relevant today. The demons who take possession of the government are dressed like men of government, but they do not know the duty of government. The duty of government, as we mentioned earlier, is to make sure people have whatever they need to practice the goal of life, Krishna consciousness, by providing the necessities of life and the direction towards the goal of life. And that is especially done by a class of persons known as the Brahmanas, who are given facility to spread the glories of the Lord and at the same time are protected by the ruling class in order to do that. Nowadays, the Brahmins, the teachers, are seen as simply parasites on society. Uh, they have no worth. They are not given any respect. And, if, and sometimes they even lose their uh, role in society and become like everybody else in order to live. Because Brahmanas are not meant to work. They are supported by the rest of the population because they give transcendental knowledge, guidance in government. They guide those who are ruling the government in the practical terms on how to rule a population. They know the science and they don't take active part, but they are advisors, guides, and uh, directors and they are, uh, their counsel is seen as perfect, absolute. Uh, every society is meant to have a council of religious men who are being referred to whenever there's a need for uh, political uh, activities to expand themselves in different directions. So that's the, so Brahmins are not very much appreciated nowadays and hardly we find any real Brahmins unless those who are engaged in devotional service. So this is an interesting verse because it is quite prophetic. <laughs> this whole, actually this verse and the, the following verses are heralding the appearance of Krishna into the world. And why did Krishna appear in the world? It explains that also, that Mother Earth, overburdened by the demoniac population, was being prayed, was, uh, prayed to, along with the leading demigods headed by Lord Brahma. They came to the milk ocean uh, on Swetadweep, the planet in the material world, which is a spiritual planet, which is inhabited by the Lord and his former Shira Daksha Vishnu. They came and offered beautiful prayers to the Lord and the Lord appeared in order to reduce the demons and the, reduce the, uh, the um, demoniac influence within the world. And that's the whole 10th canto. You'll see Krishna practically one particular demon after another. What we hear or what we read, what is available to us is just a small part of the amount of demons that Krishna killed. Uh, as it says in the, um, in, 
Shastra by Jiva Goswami, Gopal Champu, and it mentions that Krishna was killing on the average two demons per day. One in the morning part of the day and one in the later part of the day. So that time they were very profuse. Now Prabhupada says the demons, they're different. They have suit and tie. They look like everybody else, but they, their business is to simply exploit material resources and cause trouble to the devotees here. And so it says here, the devotees of the Lord uh, and the demons try to impede the advancement of Krishna consciousness. Therefore, when Krishna sees that they're giving trouble to the Krishna conscious movement, then Krishna arranges from them to fight amongst themselves. And then the population of the demons on the earth will reduce and the burden of the earth will also reduce. I was just reading today in one verse and actually we spoke on this verse in today's Srimad Bhagavatam class that this this Krishna consciousness movement uh, is actually an eternal movement it's not something people might think that appeared in a certain time it's been going on from time immemorial um, and the verse indicated that that in the higher planets uh, glorification of the Lord Sankirtan was going on amongst the devas. And Prabhupada goes on to explain that at one point, due to some bad luck, that's what he said, bad luck, uh, this Krishna conscious movement was stopped. And then again, when Lord Chaitanya came, he revived it again and put everything in place, along with all with his devotees, to carry on his movement to today and when and when Srila Prabhupada came, being the empowered representative of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he took Krishna consciousness and spread it throughout the world. And so this way people will have a chance to go back home, back to God and, and achieve the goal of life. Otherwise, if we are not with uh, without saintly activity, this world is simply hell. It's already hell because the demons want to make it hell. They are always disturbing people. <laughs> and when they disturb the devotees, just like when Hirani Kashipu, along with his followers, had taken over the proprietorship of all three worlds for, for a while, um, the demigods were her being harassed. And uh, even uh, the devotees were being harassed. Uh, Lord Brahma came with some demigods to pray to Lord, please come and take care of this rascal Harani Kashipu. And the Lord said, I know all about the activities of Harani Kashipu. But when he harasses my pure devotee, I will take some action. And then, of course, when he started to harass, Balad Maharaj, then the Lord actually came. So when the demons become powerful, the mode of material energy, passion becomes prominent and the demons flourish. And the Lord allows that to happen because he has put the material energy in progress. But when the devotees become more and more uh, numerous and practice Krishna consciousness, the world starts moving towards the mode of goodness and then saintly rule and saintly activities become a day-to-day -day affair. Now we have demoniac activities. And Prabhupada's interesting because he said in this, in this verse here that people are simply working hard day and night unnecessarily just to provide the basic needs of life. And throughout the Bible time, it says, you know, one should not simply work hard. Nayam deho deho bhajam nirkoka kastan karma arati vid bhujam jay. The Bhagavad Divyam Putraka Dhyana said, Vam Brahma sokam tam anantam. And this is verse is spoken by the Lord himself in the first verse of the fifth canto of the fifth chapter. 
And he says that, you know, human life is not meant to work hard like dogs and us, uh, dogs and hogs, who simply live to eat, you know, abominable foodstuffs. Human life is tabo dibyam, putra kadyena sadvam, in order to achieve Brahma Sokyam. Brahma Sokyam means eternal, lasting happiness. What is that lasting happiness? Krishna consciousness. That is the actual goal of life. And it's natural. But the demons have turned this world into a place where people are slaving day and night simply to ma maintain. And people are struggling so hard just to live from day to day. Of course, you know, many people are finding ways to get around that, but still this is, becomes the program. Work hard, give your sweat and energy in order for economic progress, so-called economic progress. In other words, have more material things, have more material activities, and, you know, enjoy your senses as much as possible. This is demoniac policies. <laughs> and people buy into it as the way that we have to live. And human life is not meant to work hard for the basic needs of life. Living, living human beings are meant atato brahma jigyasa. Bhagavatam begins by saying, the goal of human life is to inquire into the nature of the absolute truth. To eat, to sleep, to have family life, and to defend these things are naturally provided by the Lord according to one's needs. If one practices Krishna consciousness automatically or, or successfully, these things automatically come. Prabhupada would always say, the elephant in Africa, he's eating 40 kgs of food a day, more than 80 pounds of food. He doesn't work. Where is he getting all his food from? From Krishna. The birds, they don't work, but food is provided for them. When they, when they are born, there's always one female and one male bird. So, you know, the sexes are there for having family life within the bird society. Everything is there. <laughs> it's arranged by God naturally. But the demons have interfered with the natural arrangement of God in creating this Ugra Karma society. Work hard, work hard, work hard. What's the word? The word is uh, apra. What is it? Uh, what is it? Apramatta or something like that. Pramatta and Apramatta. That one, that material life by demoniac principles means to simply labor unnecessarily, where people are just don't have time to do even normal human activities just to maintain a family. Prabhupada was shocked. He uh, was going, when he first came to America, he was shocked to see how the Americans were living. He met one Indian lady in New York City and uh, they were talking. Prabhupada got to know that this Indian lady had a, a grown up son. So Prabhupada said, do you have plans to get your son married? And she said, yes, but only if he can support a family. Prabhupada was thinking, oh, supporting a family is such a big thing. It's so hard. <laughs> when the animals do it so naturally, the humans have to struggle so hard just to support a family, which is the basic principle of human life. Because everything has been turned upside down by this materialistic demoniac society, where people have to work, 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 and not only do they get very little for their work, whatever monies they make is taxed by the government also. So they make you work and take half, more, half or more than half of your pay for more and more government taxes. And so the government becomes more and more top heavy. There's more, you see 
uh, I came across a statistic, well, maybe 20 years ago. It's probably even, the statistic is even greater now that 51% of the population of the United States of America have, have activities that are connected with government agencies. In other words, people work in some kind of social or political or economic agency that's collect, connected with the government. They want to bring in more and more people, exploit them, and people who are in government, they get, they get big fat salaries, live material, so-called materially comfortable at the expense of the people. And rather than serving the people, they use the people to serve their own senses. This is today's uh, society. It's not something that we hear, hear about. It's something we are right in the midst of today. So Krishna has a plan. If their numbers uh, will increase more and more, if the burden of the demons on the earth gets so much, Krishna increases their military power. We see that in the world. Practically every major country in the world spends a lot, the largest proportion of the income that they receive for military expenditures. I think in America, it is something like billions of dollars per year on military expenditures, Have, having vast amounts of armies, vast amounts of military equipment, vast amounts of military personnel, and more and more ideas for increasing that. This is, as it says here, the Asuras are very much interested in increasing their military power. <laughs> and you see around the world, many countries are doing the same thing. And so as the society becomes more and more demoniac in its principles and activities, the demons become more powerful. And then there is more likely that uh, the Lord will arrange for that burden of the earth to be diminished by these major, major wars. If you look at the history, it says in the United States of America, when it was first constituted as a government in 1776, that was only 250 years ago. <laughs> uh, there has been 17 years where there was no war. <laughs> Out of the 250 years, there have been 17 years that the United States has not been either directly or indirectly involved in some kind of war around the world. So wars are always going on. <laughs> and sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small, but when they get big, everybody notices it. And then the whole society is in chaos. And so that chaos doesn't come automatically or just all of a sudden. It comes with this buildup of demoniac influence in the world. But Krishna is in control and he knows how to make the demons powerful where they destroy each other like that. And then the, as Prabhupada says, then the devotees will have good opportunities to preach Krishna consciousness to the world. Okay, so I thought we explored this other aspect of Krishna, which is one of his more uh, active aspects, killing demons. Krishna, he has so many names that Kamsahanta is one of his names, the one who killed Kamsa. So there are many names of Krishna uh, where it is connected to him destroying demons. <laughs> okay, and for the demons that are destroyed by Krishna directly, they get liberation, the demonic activities stop, and they get benefited uh, and by becoming liberated from material energy. Okay, so we'll open it up and see if there's any comments or Questions? Thank you so much, Maharaj, for a wonderful class. Thank you. Dear devotees, if there are any questions, comments, please go ahead.
Rune, do you have to increase your volume? Thank you. Oh, sorry, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj, for a wonderful class and enlightening. We can't. We cannot hear you at all. Can you hear now, Maharaj? Am Hardly. I... It's a. It's a great strain. Please increase your volume. Take your earphones out. <laughs> okay. Sure, Maharaj. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, there was some problem with my laptop, I guess. I'm really sorry for that. Thank you for your class today. And I request devotees, if there are any questions, comments, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances or glories to Srila Prabhupada. This is so heartening to hear Guru Maharaj, how Krishna is really on the side of devotees and is arranging everything because in these difficult times, it's so, um, it's so important. That. It's so important for us to hear this, that Krishna is arranging everything, he's in control, and though everything is so bleak and dark and difficult and everything, if we simply take shelter of Krishna, Krishna will make all the arrangements so that we can advance in our Krishna consciousness. So I'm feeling very encouraged after hearing this lecture. Thank you so much. That's Lord Chaitanya's uh, reason for appearing in this world to push forth the plan of worldwide Krishna consciousness. And part of that is removing the demoniac element. <laughs> Krishna dying. When Krishna was personally here, he did it directly. But now when he's not here in the personal sense, um, he's there in the name. He does it through the material energy. <laughs> It's so important to hear this, Guru Maharaj. So thank you so much for choosing this uh, topic today. It is very encouraging for me to hear this class. I'm going to hear it again and again. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. It's amazing when you read that verse, how prophetic it is. Very true. Sometimes we think what is happening, there is so much of chaos and confusion and it seems as though the demons are getting the upper hand more and more and more. But now I can see that is Krishna's arrangement. They say, uh, you know, power destroys the person. So they probably become more and more uh, intoxicated with their own power and then they wage war on each other and then they are annihilated. And so mm -hmm. devotees can advance through this. Yeah, the devotees have no worries as long as they take shelter of Krishna, particularly his holy name. Yes, it will be difficulties when demons are here. There is some disturbance in the lives of the devotees, but these disturbances are 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 uh, tolerated, and then Krishna and devotees take shelter of Krishna. Mm -hmm. They cause disturbance, mm -hmm. like they're doing now. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, thank you so much, Maharaj, uh, for the class today. I have a question from yesterday. Uh, that how do we know that somebody is faithless and today because uh, you were mentioning about the demoniac mentality sometimes it's very hard to distinguish between a person who is faithless and somebody who is demoniac is well, faithless similar to demoniac uh here we go in such a yuga the demons were on different planets 
In Treta Yuga, the demons were on different continents. In Tupora Yuga, the demons were in different families. In Kali Yuga, everything is mixed up. <laughs> it's hard to even decipher or to understand the difference of, you have to understand by quality and characteristic and not so much by, you know, uh, what we say, uh, divisions. As Prabhupada said, in the same body, the demon and the devotee is there. So if we live by demoniac principles and propagate that as our way of life, we become like that. So we're affected by that. But aside from all that, there are persons who are actually within that category of demons. Their program is to give trouble to others and to exploit the resources of the material energy. Some of them are born on this planet and some of them come from other planets and take birth on this planet in order to uh, exploit. Just like there is what is called the uh, karma uh, calculation. So the higher planets, the karma is in the mode of goodness. In the lower planets, the more of the karma is in the mode of ignorance. So there's demons on the lower planets, there's devas in the higher planets. On the middle planets, there's somewhat of a balance, but that balance can shift one way or the other. So when demonic principles are being implemented, people are following, the karmic calculation of the middle planets start to move in that particular direction. So that means more and more demons will take birth on the earth because the karma is moving in that direction because people take birth by karma, karma daiva natrena. So you might find that people who are in very affluent and very powerful positions in this world are actually demons. Their business is to exploit, their business is to uh, give trouble to others. And uh, they go on as normal, so-called normal people within society. So they have no faith. If you read the 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, they are faithless. They believe that sex desire is the cause of life. And simply by that, the people are born. That's all. They don't see the hand of God behind anything. In fact, they don't even believe in God, many of them. They think God is simply an idea created in order for people to find some solace amongst the suffering of this world. They, as one famous uh, political person who is both an economist and a revolutionist said that uh, God is the opiate of the people. In other words, God, people who need some crutch to fall back on they have created this idea of God. There's no such thing as God. Uh, everything works under the control of the, how, of the material energy, and that is the absolute principle. Therefore, they worship material energy by exploiting material energy and trying to control the material energy. And that's just demoniac mentality. But it goes on as social and political policies, economic, especially economic policies. What is our economic policies? How people can get more and more, be enticed to use more and more material things that are being coming from the earth. The earth is being exploited for resources in order to create the things that people don't need. The statistic is that 150 years ago, or you might say in the year 1850, the, uh, the reason, not the resources, but the, uh, the uh, availabilities of things on the market, the general market, 95% of those things were considered to be in the category of necessity. 5% were in the category 
of non-essential or not necessary. Now the uh, percentages have switched around. 95% of the things that you go on in the markets today are non-essential. You don't need them. They simply are there to dazzle people's minds. People are always coming up with new night. Every week, 250 new inventions go to the US Patent Office to get approval to be put on the market. That's an average, 250 items a week. People are always coming up with new ideas on how to sell another product that people don't need. <laughs> I mean, we used to brush our teeth with, with eucalyptus twigs or cherry twigs from a tree. Then they came up with toothpaste and toothbrush. That wasn't enough. Now you have to have an electric toothbrush. You push a button and it moves by itself. <laughs> electric shavers, electric this, mechanical this, mechanical that, all resources from the earth being used in the most wasteful way on only all oh, for this false sense of economic development. To think economic development is categorized by how many material things there are. But that is a false sense of categorization. Economic development, it means if you have grains, if you have milk products, if you have livestock, if you have valuable resources, uh, such as precious metals, if you have land, that is economic development. Not all this, to use the word, junk that they sell in the stores. The stores are stocked up with stuff that people don't need. And in order to sell things that people don't need, there's a whole big industry called advertising. Advertising means to create the need when there's no need there. And it's all about, that's why I tell the devotees, don't watch television. Television is simply one advertisement after another for some product you don't need. <laughs> It's all about trying to sell you something. And they have an, another policy which has recently been developed ever since computers have become fashionable in everybody's home, is that, that they study people's spending power, how people spend their money. And after understanding a particular person's interest in spending, they bombard that person with similar material uh, things for them to buy. They study how you spend and then they give you more and more of the same ideas so you spend more and more and more. And this, so this capitalistic society is artificial. It's simply meant on exploitation of the earth and exploitation of people's moral, religious and aesthetic values, turning people into machines simply to work and when, when people can come up with the amount of industry that they want, they're creating robots to do the same thing. The machines are now replacing people and doing what people were doing. And so people are out of work in some areas of the world and some of the bigger industrial. And what happens when people are not given any kind of natural employment? Crime increases. As they say, idle mind is a devil's workshop. Ever since this economic adventure hit India in the last two decades, India has now had, are getting drug addictions, prostitution, abortions, um, and various types of crimes related uh, to uh, people, you know, having nothing to do. <laughs> So this whole civilization is false. It's a demoniac civilization created for exploitation, for the aggrandizement of a very few people at the expense of everything, everybody else. Therefore, we've been talking about it and Prabhupada was pushing it, live simply, grow your own food, keep your own livestock, get land, 
learn how to live with the basic necessities of life and spend time with the goal of life. That is, spend time with chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and engaging in devotional service. There's where we make progress in life. One does not have to struggle for the needs that are basic to the human existence. As we mentioned earlier, the animals get everything they need by the arrangement of God. Why doesn't the human beings do that? Because they have given up the natural arrangement of God and taken to this artificial lifestyle. Therefore, they have to work hard in order to maintain it. So yeah, people are faithless. That's one of the characteristics of the demoniac uh, qualities. No faith in God, no faith in um, and saintly, saintly activities or saintly people either. Where in society are saintly persons glorified? Nowhere. The churches, the temples, the synagogues, uh, the various religious institutions are pushed on the side. They, they actually, the society considers them to be bothersome in some ways because they don't really produce anything. Uh, what we say is uh, uh, beneficial in the material sense. So, um, yeah, we're living in a very interesting time. Mm -hmm. Interesting, I use the word interesting because it's right at the peak of Lord Chaitanya's movement. As Lord Chaitanya has come to push this Krishna conscious movement around the world, it was gro it's growing and still growing. It slows down every once in a while for whatever reasons and then it picks up. But it has continued to grow. And that is the threat to the demoniac society. Therefore, they see our movement as simply a threat to material progress. And people will patronize our movement in order to look good, but behind the scenes, they have no interest in what we're doing. Mm. Not, I'm just giving you a small dose of what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada said, if you read Srimad Bhagavatam, and this is an exact statement, you will know everything. Social, mm -hmm. political, economic, moral, aesthetic, medical, <laughs> uh, spiritual. Everything is in Srimad Bhagavatam. Read it. Study it. Prabhupada put everything in the Bhagavatam. All we have to do is take a careful study of Bhagavatam and you'll find the solutions of all the problems of life and what causes the problems of life and how to avoid it. Everything is there. Bhagavatam is the bright light, as it, as it mentions in Bhagavatam itself. It's the bright light in this dark age of Kali to give people a direction out of this, this age of, of um, hypocrisy, lying and cheating and so on. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, it does Maharaj, but I have, um... I still want some clarification on uh, the society that we are living in, as you are saying, that is full of demonic people. And it has come to the extent that in each and every individual, not at just the family level, but even at individual level, we find uh, demonic qualities within us. Yeah. So then how do we, because, you know, we were, talking about this chanting thing yesterday and you mentioned at some point that be aware of um, not uh, giving Krishna's name. I think Lavanya Mataji or somebody asked about how to give Krishna's name. 
and you told you gave her guidance and then you said but be careful of not to give it to somebody who is faithless because that's a type of offense so then how do we you know these qualities that you're saying are there but sometimes it's hard to recognize that if we don't know a person and even when we know a person what happens is that because there is all mostly a mixture so we see that there are two kinds of personalities within one personality how do we judge to save ourselves from this offense but at the same time keep preaching as well how do we differentiate who is faithless and who is not well you look for their good qualities and then you try to enhance that you find what makes what what is it about them that is of the mode of goodness or some good quality and then you try to enhance that in different ways in other words trying to bring out people's good qualities which automatically suppresses or pushes out those negative qualities now let me give you a little bit more specific the world is made up of three categories of people the saintly the demoniac and the innocent now the innocent are being influenced by both sides the saintly are saintly the demoniac are demonic they're they're fixed that's an absolute category but most people are in the middle category which is innocent because they're being misled by the demoniac principles they tend to take on these qualities themselves mm. when they get influenced by the the uh, spiritual qualities they become influenced in that area so now as the world has been developing the middle of the road people the innocent people are becoming less they are the bigger category the demon demons are there the devotees are there we're they're the two smaller categories out of those two the de the demons are bigger in this in the two smaller categories at least in, in this present age of kali yuga and it's increasing in that way but as as people are influenced by one way or the other they may also move out of that innocent category into one of the other two categories like that so you see more intoxication more illicit activities more 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 lying cheating this sometimes people take to these things in order to survive the materialistic society by which they're placed into and even good people so called good people become bad by bad influence or by bad association because that tendency is there but they have the other tendency too to bring them closer to god through the process of krishna consciousness but that's where we place our emphasis on trying to enhance their good qualities by directing them towards krishna and we can encourage them to chant we can encourage them to take prashadam prashadam as prabhupad says prashadam is our secret weapon uh the holy name is our main weapon and prashadam is the secret weapon the secret weapon means it's working but no one can see how it's working it's purifying people through the process of eating so we give prashadam we we spread the glories of the holy name through different programs now in in london itself there is a group called kirtan london i don't know if you know about them it's a it's a group of about 25 to 30 young people and some older people who have got together to make kirtan available to everyone and anyone through various programs including educational programs that center around the glories of the holy name and that's a wonderful program um uh, it's expanding and so this is pulling in yeah a lot of people who don't know what to, which way to go in life anymore they're confused they can't depend on getting a good education and getting a good job because it's it's not like that anymore 
Even if you get a so-called good education, no one's guaranteed to get a job anymore. And even if they get a job, they don't even know what kind of situation they'll find themselves in. So yeah, it's a very uh, interesting time, very good time for spreading Krishna consciousness. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for this, um, this wonderful trick, I would say, that when this, this world is full of mixture of Varna Shankara, you know, we can, um, we can try to enhance the quality uh, that they have, the good qualities that they have in a Krishna conscious way. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good solution because yesterday when I heard you saying, I was wondering that, wow, this is a challenging thing. You know, we want to preach, but then what if we end up preaching someone who is faithless and we would be in trouble because we are making offense. So Maharaj, how do we make offense by preaching to somebody who is faithless? Now, yeah, that's explained. It says, do not preach the glories of the Lord to the faithless. That, that doesn't include encouraging people to take to Krishna consciousness. We do that regularly. But when you get into trying to speak about the more esoteric benefits that come by way of practicing chanting of the holy name, then people may misunderstand or will under misunderstand and they will commit offenses either to themselves, which makes their own spiritual life become more difficult, or they'll criticize what we are saying like that. So uh, they keep it very simple. And as we mentioned yesterday, we all gave some examples. The Chant Hare Krishna, and you'll actually be happy. Chant Hare Krishna, you can relieve yourself from material suffering. These are the basic things. Not that Chant Hare Krishna, and then, you know, you can associate with Krishna in the spiritual world as a gopi. And that we don't, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it means. Mm. Yeah. So to further conclude and clarify my understanding, so because the when we glorify um, more deeper level um, philosophy or the, as you said, the esoteric pastimes with the faithless person or somebody who is practicing Krishna consciousness, but probably they are not at that level. Um, so because the offenses that they make we would be responsible for that. One of the offenses to the chanting of the holy name. But if someone is practicing Krishna consciousness, that's, that doesn't include them. We, oh. This is about people who are not practicing Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. There's an old saying in the Christian tradition, do not throw valuable pearls before swines. In other words, a swine is a pig. If you give pearls to a, a pig, what's he going to do with it? He's going to step mm -hmm. on it. He's going to chew on it, chew it. Mm. He doesn't know the value. That's what the uh, same thing. Do not talk about the glories of the holy name to people who are of that nature. But Prabhupada says, Sometimes when we give our public lectures, we find there are faithless persons in there, but yet we speak. So sometimes we actually inadvertently transgress this particular principle in a group, but on a one-to-one -one basis, one should be very conscious not to do that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that clarifies my much. Mm -hmm. You see the point? There are different ways you can speak about the glories of the Holy Name. Yes. And it's not good for them if they become critical because it makes their spiritual life 
to, uh, less available for them. Rather than trying to help them, you're bringing them down. That's the point there also. Yes. Yes, this is, um, yeah, this is very good clarification, Maharaj. And um, I just want to personally remember this, that there are many ways to elevate a person to Krishna consciousness. That's what it means to preach, to yes. know your audience. Preaching means to know the audience. Mm -hmm. That is called adhikari. Adhikari means what is the nature or qualifications of the people I'm speaking to. Just like in etiquette, when in exhibiting etiquette to different types of people, it's always done accordingly. It's never done in the same way. Yes. Know, know your audience, that's all. A good book that will help you understand that principle is composed by His Holiness Shiva Ram Maharaj called Sura Bhakti Chintamani. Hmm. It's a very good book. It's one of the series of his Vrindavan series. It's a book worth reading and also studying. Uh, it gives the whole science Krishna consciousness but it also helps us to understand uh, the preaching aspect when it comes to delivering the message accordingly, mm. which is very important. Yes, because we are representing Krishna. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. that's something that um, we have learned repeatedly here um, in, in Janmashtami, when we go for the voluntary service at the time of Janmashtami, every year in the training, that thing has been drilled down. Yeah, you don't, you don't treat your child as you treat your husband, obviously. You, you, there's a different relationship between you and your children and you and your husband. That means you relate accordingly, according to that relationship. And you don't treat, you don't have the same relationship with your husband as you do with people on the outside. So we always have different ways of relating to people according to that, to the category of relationships. Krishna showed that personally when he came into Hastinapur and he met different types of people. He responded and interacted with people according to their particular category. Some he shook hands with, some he bowed down with, some he gave a smile to, some he, you know, gave some friendly gestures. There is eight, I think, eight different ways that Krishna related to eight different categories of people, just to show how the Lord was teaching the, the process of etiquette amongst different categories. It's interesting. It's in the uh, hmm. it's in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. I'm trying to think of the uh, the ch chapter. When it's he interesting. You see how yeah. The, I'm not sure the when particular. When he goes to Parka, right? Hmm? When he leaves Hastinapur or when he goes to Dwarka? It might be uh, when he goes to Dwarka. Mm. No, no, it's not Dwarka because he's relating to uh, Yudhisthira, the Pandavas, uh, the sages, uh, to children, to friends, to his relatives, like that. I think um, the verse is 111, first canto, 11th chapter, verse number 22. Take a look at that verse. This is a guess by me. 
my mind is a little unclear of the, the see if you can find it. Runda, can you put that verse up? 111, 22. Let's see if this is it. Yeah, this is it. We got yes. it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> wow. Read it. Somebody read it. Can I read Somebody it? Somebody read it. No. The Almighty Lord greeted everyone present by bowing his head, exchanging greetings, embracing, shaking hands, looking and smiling, giving assurances and awarding benedictions even to the lowest in rank. Mm -hmm. Go down the purport. I think it mentions uh, here. To receive yes, yes, the... Yeah, every one of them was properly... Yeah, go ahead. To receive the Lord Shri Krishna there, sorry, to receive the Lord Shri Krishna, there were all grades of population, beginning from Vasudev, Ugrasen, and Gargamuni, the father, grandfather, and teacher, down to the prostitutes and chandalas who are accustomed to eat dogs. And every one of them was properly greeted by the Lord in terms of rank and position. As pure living entities, all are the separated parts and parcels of the Lord. And thus, no one is alien by his eternal relation. Such pure living entities are graded differently in terms of contamination of the modes of material nature. But the Lord is equally affectionate to all his parts and parcels, despite material gradation. He descends only to recall these materialistic living beings back to his kingdom. And intelligent persons take advantage of this facility offered by the personality of Godhead to all living beings. No one is rejected by the Lord from the kingdom of God. And it remains with the living being to accept this or not. Jai. So much assurance. Does that help? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Shows how compassionate the Lord is. But in his compassion, he takes time to greet people accordingly. Yes. So I think if you count, there's eight different ways that he responded. Mm. Yes. Eight. Interesting verse, huh? Yeah. Yes. Getting, trying to get answer of one question. I. Um, I got more clarifications. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's Bhagavatam. You can answer the question from so many angles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Thank because you. Maharaj, I was, um, I had one, um, sometimes I think I have asked this question before also and today not trying to ask but just trying to reveal my mind that sometimes I just feel disheartened for a few moments you know or a couple of days sometimes it stretches to that you know it's so much purification is needed when will I get there and trying to get some insight from you from the uh, offense point of view for by preaching the faithless I Krishna through you answered that question as well, you know, kind of reassured me. It wasn't a question, but just kind of reassured me that I'll get there. Yeah, <laughs> if you stay with the process and fix your mind on the, on the, on the activities, you're guaranteed to move forward ultimately to perfection. Hmm. And as you make progress, you'll start to see indications. We go along. Sometimes it appears we're going up and down. But if we stay steady, we'll notice that after some time, we make a qualitative leap in our Krishna consciousness. It becomes quite noticeable. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Hare Krishna. 
Okay, Varunda, how are we doing? Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Uh, thank you, Vanasi Matsumi, for wonderful questions. And Maharaj, thank you so much for answering them so much in detail. Even I got to know many things. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions uh, for Maharaj? Any last minute question? Okay, I think we okay. Okay. Sure. our time. Sure, Maharaj, yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Maharaj. So we'll see you all tomorrow, same time. Yes. Yeah, so the program will go on tomorrow, same time. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for resuming Delhi classes. I'm so grateful to you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. All glories to Shiva. All glories to Shiva. All glories to Shiva.